At the height of the constitutional crisis over Watergate, an event that would have even longer lasting repercussions took place on the other side of the globe. On October 20th, 1973, the Arab members of the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC, declared an embargo on oil shipments to the United States. Combined with the embargo was a series of cutbacks in OPEC production. All of this was largely in protest against American support for Israel in the Yom Kippur War of 1973. With the price of crude oil spiking, the price for a gallon of gas spiked as well. Worst of all, Americans now faced gasoline shortages for the first time since World War II. There were long lines at gas stations, and the federal government lowered the speed limit on interstate highways from 70 to 55 miles per hour in order to conserve fuel. As H.W. Brands wrote, if anything epitomized the waning of America's economic supremacy, it was the gas lines and the lower speed limit. The embargo was lifted and the long lines and rationing disappeared, but the higher prices and lower speed limits did not. By the mid-1970s, it seemed that the United States was running out of everything. There were shortages of beef, raisins, wire, sugar, and even pennies when people heard that the copper they contained was worth more than one cent and began hoarding them. The power of television to shape events was revealed again in December 1973 when late-night comedian Johnny Carson made a joke about a looming shortage of toilet paper. The next day, supermarkets were cleared of toilet paper as viewers rushed to stock up. The next night, Carson explained that he was joking that there was no shortage of toilet paper, except that now there was a shortage as a result of panic buying. The 1970s saw the rise of an economic condition that came to be called stagflation, an unprecedented double dose of stagnating unemployment and inflation. Economic theory held that you could not have both high unemployment and inflation at the same time, but that's exactly what took place in the 70s. As one commentator on the 1970s has said, stagflation was the single greatest cause of the malaise for which the decade is remembered. Stagflation was probably a bigger factor in people's lives than Watergate or any of the other crises of the decade. And it presented a real dilemma for policymakers since the usual remedy for inflation was to chill the economy with higher taxes or interest rates. But with unemployment already high, chilling the economy would be very painful as even more people would be thrown out of work. President Gerald Ford and his economic advisors first tried to tame inflation. Calling his program WIN for Whip Inflation Now, Ford called on Americans to spend less and save more. In order to help or force Americans to comply, he called for a tax hike of $5 billion. No sooner had he unveiled his new plan than unemployment shot up to 6.5%. Ford now did a 180 and called for tax cuts to stimulate hiring. This reversal failed miserably. Inflation stayed in double digits and unemployment rose to almost 9%. Ford simply looked inept. Once again, the power of TV was revealed. Coinciding with Ford's mishandling of the economy and his misadventures on the ski slopes and the golf course, as well as bumping his head and falling down while exiting Air Force One, was the debut of a new late night comedy show on NBC. This, of course, was Saturday Night Live. One of SNL's first stars was Chevy Chase, who mimicked Ford's pratfalls and, along with other comedians, helped cement in the public mind the image of Jerry Ford as an incompetent bumbler. Despite his problems, Ford got the Republican nomination for president in 1976. Opposing him was James Earl Jimmy Carter, who came out of nowhere to win the Democratic nomination. Carter was such an unknown as far as national politics was concerned that when he told his own mother that he was planning to run for president, she asked in all seriousness, president of what? Carter was smart and had some executive experience as governor of Georgia, but as Bill Brand says, his main qualification was that he hadn't been anywhere near Washington during the years of Vietnam, Watergate, and the other blunders of still painful memory. When he stood before the Democratic Convention to accept the party's nomination, 
He began his acceptance speech with the line he had used thousands of times when he went door to door introducing himself to voters. I'm Jimmy Carter and I'm running for president. The campaign waged during America's bicentennial year was generally uninspiring. In the end, Carter won a narrow victory. Ford was a good loser who said that he wanted to be remembered as a nice person who worked at the job and who left the White House in better shape than when I took over. Historian James Patterson calls this a fair evaluation of Ford's brief, often troubled stint as president during politically polarized times. Patterson says that Carter was also widely regarded as a decent, gracious, and compassionate man. But like the last professionally trained engineer to occupy the White House, Herbert Hoover, Carter was a hard-working but uninspiring technocrat and numbers cruncher who was fixated on detail. And like Hoover, Carter had the misfortune of presiding over a terrible economy. When it came to foreign policy, Carter's record included both impressive achievements and disastrous failures. By far, his greatest accomplishment in foreign policy was bringing the leaders of Israel and Egypt together at Camp David, Maryland, to sign a historic peace agreement. Unfortunately, the Middle East was also the scene of Carter's worst foreign policy disaster, the Iranian hostage crisis. On November 4, 1979, a mob of Iranian youths loyal to the militant regime of the Ayatollah Khomeini scaled the walls of the U.S. Embassy in Tehran, overpowered the guards, and seized over 50 American hostages. The Iranian hostage crisis would last for more than a year, longer than Carter's presidency, as it turned out. It was just the most demoralizing event of a very demoralizing year, 1979. The Iranian revolution that brought the Ayatollah to power led to another energy crisis in 1979. Petroleum prices doubled from their previous highs, and the oil increases had an inflationary ripple effect on the rest of the economy. Shortages of gasoline became serious in the United States again. Spurred by the rise in oil prices, the rate of inflation for 1979 ultimately averaged 11.3 percent, an extraordinarily high rate that more than any other single development unnerved the American people and damaged Carter's presidency. Nuclear energy had seemed like a good alternative to fossil fuels until March 1979 when a near meltdown at the Three Mile Island nuclear reactor near Harrisburg, Pennsylvania stoked fears of a nuclear disaster. Most of the problems of 1979 lasted through 1980, making the last two years of Carter's presidency in many ways grimmer than any in the recent history of the country, in James Patterson's phrase. When Carter gave a televised address on July 15, 1979, in which he described what he called the nation's moral and spiritual crisis, it seemed to some that he had lost confidence in the American people. Most of the American people seemed to have lost confidence in Carter. By 1979, the middle of the year, Carter's approval rating stood at an abysmal 29%. If Jimmy Carter was the Democratic version of Herbert Hoover, then former actor and governor of California Ronald Reagan was the Republican Franklin Roosevelt. The main thing Roosevelt had offered Americans in 1932 was optimism. Reagan offered the same sense of hope in 1980 when he defeated Carter for the presidency. And so, the grim decade of the 1970s ended on Tuesday, January 20th, 1981, when the ever-optimistic Ronald Wilson Reagan took the oath of office as President of the United States.